say. That was fun. What's the next it's, part? It's kind of like the opposite, or the, the my version of How does your it song? go like the rest of it, though? I don't know. I make it up each time. It's different. I'm not, I don't have that gift. Well, see? We're you're musically so cr- talented in different ways. You're so creative. Oh, welcome to the show, everybody. Episode 267. We are here for your listening pleasure. What do you want to talk about? How are you, Sarah? I'm doing excellent. Uh, I have an update. Okay. Sort of an update. More of like a... Follow-up. Follow-up. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that I need to correct that I said earlier. Okay. So I have a friend named Bree. Shout out to Bree. Uh, who is a big time brain candy brainiac. We love her. And I saw her this weekend and... Well, a little bit ago. And uh, she was like, you know, I love your show, but I have to tell you there's something that you got wrong. And here I'm thinking, oh, God, what did I say? She said, remember when you talked about bees and you were talking about how, like, it, there's a little scout bee that goes out and, like, he sends the information and he comes back and he sends the information, like, with pheromones or something or whatever the heck I said. She was like, well, you were close, but you missed out on probably the best piece of the whole story. I go, what? She goes, do you know about the waggle dance? I was like, uh, no. So this little scalpy that goes back and the way the big... He gives bl- directions. Give directions is with a dance. Yeah. And the best part is he dances with his butt. And however uh, fast and quick the dance is, is how excited he is about where no. all the good stuff is. Yeah. And like there's certain angles. Like so he moves his butt and he does it at like a 45 degree angle with like to the sun and also a 45 degree angle to where this future or like the location of the pollen is. So there's all like math behind it. And it's the freaking cutest thing that the little guy does with his bum. I cannot believe that. Me I didn't the, I knew about the dance vaguely, but I did not know that the ferocity of the yeah. dance was how excited he was about the flowers. It says the farther the target, the longer the waggle phase. The more excited no. yes, the more excited the bee is about the location, the more rapidly it waggles, so as to grab the attention of observing uh, observing bees and try to convince them. If wow. multiple bees are doing the waggle dance, it's a competition to convince the observing bees to follow their lead. And competing bees may even disrupt another dance to fight each other off. See, bees are assholes. Sorry, Linda, but they are. What? Like, what are they competing for? They are- They're like, my place is the best. No, my place is the best. It's kind of like your so friend. Like, you're like, hey, where are we going to go to dinner tonight? And your one friend's like, oh my God, I just went to the greatest Indian food restaurant. It's so fantastic. And the other friend's like, no, no, no. I went to the best Thai place. We have to go to the Thai place. They have to like compete. So but are you, you saying that they have different one. locations? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant Competing they information. Were, they had like the same location, different routes to, Di- oh. to get there. Different routes. I think it's different locations. Okay. They're like trying to like tell you, no, 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 mine's better. Why did your friend know that? Oh, good question. Because she majored in animal biology and she is a vet tech and is doing all that stuff. Oh my God. She showed me the funniest video. (laughs) I don't hope she doesn't get in trouble for this one. But uh, (laughs) she has a video of herself doing the Britney Spears dance with the snake. You know, no uh-huh. way. she was like, listen, we were testing the pythons for like their blood pressure or something like their, not blood pressure. I probably just said that because you were talking about that. Um, we were testing the snake for something and they're like, I mean, come on, you got a python. How do you not do the Britney Spears I'm dance? And snake. they like played the music and she has the walk and she's got like, she, the body like Britney Spears. It like looked perfect. I'm like, damn was girl. It, and it was a python. It. Totally. Around her neck, did the whole thing. I'm like, you Britney Spears, the heck out of that python. She's like, how do you not? And those type of snakes aren't um, biters. They're squeezers, right? Yes. They're constrictors. Yeah. Right. Better ask her if I can put that I don't know why that's less scary to me because it's just as deadly. You think a, a, oh, a constrictor? Yeah, because there's almost like the implied, like like there's time to escape. Well, and I mean, if I had, if you know you're going to die. Let's say guaranteed death. I'd rather be squeezed to death than have venom be bit into me. I totally disagree. Okay. Uh, The way that they do it. Dahlia, can you put up a poll? Please do. Find out whether people would rather die of a snake bite Uh or uh, squeeze to death. Now, here's my... my, I feel like you have to ask, how. what is the venom... Is this like toxic, like a neurotoxin where all of a sudden I'm going to start convulsing and like not and be paralyzed? Or is it like a black mamba where you're just dying in three minutes and that's it? But a 
the a way it's a, the bite that gets me. It's not the poison part. The way that a python, const, like a, a constricting snake, kills you. Like they wrap it, they wrap themselves around you, and then they listen for you to breathe. And every time you take in a deep breath, they squeeze more so that you can't physically take that again. Yeah, you can't. So you're like, like having the air and life squeezed out of you. And the worst is like they're paying attention to like your body. And that fucking freaks me out. Snakes are the worst. They are. I mean, it's how they move. It's no wonder that they became like a part of the creation mythology and like the fall of man. Because they defy like our, uh, oh, that's true. And they're always used in like creepy, like they're like the symbol. I'm watching American Horror Story right now. And yeah, snakes are like right. a big part of that. Everyone knows they're gross and terrible. Ooh. I was just reading in a book about this really sweet, lovable horse that had a deathly fear of snakes, which is not unusual. Oh. Even sn- friggin' horse are like, get me. Yeah, they know. And they could probably survive a bite because they're so big. Oh, yeah. They poor don't little, care. They're like, that guy. thing ain't, that ain't natural. Yeah. Horse? What do they do? Like send them to horse therapy it and have them do them. like exposure therapy? I don't snakes. know what they do to cure it. I just know what happens when they see one. They get oh, spooked. They do. Horses do get really scared. I also do. Right. We're all in the same boat here. Yeah. Everyone in the animal kingdom hates snakes huh. except your friend. <laughs> 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 but I mean, oh, what they, I, she probably would also love... Uh, legacy box where she could document things like when i had to deal with snakes in australia oh. on road rules ah. and it wrapped itself around me and put its head in my face and it was documented for the world to see i'll show you the footage because i can now because i put the vhs in my legacy box oh my gosh and now i have the digital copy. well i have to see this and you're so lucky they didn't keep squeezing you <laughs> i know Oh, that's why I asked. But at the time, I didn't know it was a constrictor. Maybe that's why you're not that scared. Because you're like, it's already happened to me. I am scared. I'm terrified. And I can relive it anytime <laughs> I want now. Thanks to Legacy Box. But your memories are probably more pleasurable. You yeah. know, most things that we have on VHS or whatever format are things we want to relive. Like weddings and family events and Christmas oh, yeah. and all those fun things that you... You document, but then you never get to see again because you just put them in a dusty closet or whatever. And Legacy Box solves that problem. They will digitize it for you, and you'll be able to watch it forever. And I just think it's a really nice thing. It makes a great gift for your parents who probably have all the stuff you want to watch. And there's never been a better time to digitally preserve your memories. Visit LegacyBox.com today to get started. And for a limited time, they're offering our listeners an exclusive discount. Go to LegacyBox.com slash brain to get 40% off your first order or save up to 200 bucks on the largest Legacy Box kit. Go to LegacyBox.com slash brain and save 40% today. Get start preserving your past, which is hopefully less traumatic than mine. <laughs> but if you have a good snake story, please share. I mean, Kara, you know, the zookeeper who sends mm-hmm. the snake skins oh, to me. yeah. Ooh. She loves those guys. <sighs> So does my friend. It's, it's really special, but I don't have that gift. Mm. Um, how about how I read this article on the BBC about how dummies are drinking their own pee because Why? they think it's good for them? These are dummies. And they're like, oh, I used to suffer from, you know, whatever, fibromyalgia I, or whatever. I think heck. somewhere a lot because I remember hearing like there was a, a – like an old wives' tale or whatever you call it, urban legend. About your morning pee and acne? No, about oh. cancer and pee. So, right. No, I think that might be true, though. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, just that, like, you know how... Uh, we're, can't dogs, like, sniff out cancer in your pee or something? Maybe. I don't know. But What's your saying thing? that if you drink it, it cures whatever cancer you have. That's uh, ridiculous. Of course it is. That's why it's an old wives' or urban legend or whatever. <laughs> Right. So this, I feel, I don't know where these people from, not just now, but like, as Sarah said, like the dawn of time, yeah. people have been like, you know what, let's go ahead and just drink it. I think because it's a taboo, then people think it might be magical. Right. But there's absolute, Ugh. not only is there no evidence to support that it's cures you of anything, but it also defies logic because totally. they're waste products that your body's trying to get rid of. 
Thank you. Yeah. Your body has worked really hard <laughs> to get this crap out of you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like putting it back in. Like, do they say that like if you're less hydrated, is it more effective than if you're more hydrated or what? They In the article, it didn't say. It was just saying, stop drinking your pee. <laughs> That was the takeaway. But people for uh, different things like acne. Um, acne, come on. Headache, whatever I would it imagine is. like rubbing it on your face maybe for people acne. People do that. Okay. People do that. Then How this, desperate would you have to get before you turn to pee as your solution? Like how many well, things would you have to point. try? that's a good point. I shouldn't judge. But this one lady on YouTube, she collects her dogs and drinks it. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I draw the line. At. Yep. Nope, nope, nope. Yes, she does. So, <sighs> I mean, I don't know who... They, the article gave so many examples of people that were doing it. And uh, I guess you're right. Oh, it's gosh. like a desperation thing, and it's cheap. But so it's not something that, like... Like, pee has been used historically for things. Like, like what? Actually, like, so, you, like, inspired me... Mm-hmm. And the Smithsonian came up with a list of six things that pee was actually used for. Okay. Tanning leather. Well, that's so, fine. Right? Those things like ammonia caused it to break down. Cleaning and whitening clothes. It was used like many launderers, it said, preferred it to soap. And it, Cleaning. It, it, it intensifies the colors of the dye. That's dumb. It also can be used to make gunpowder a key or a key ingredient of one of the explosives. Uh, oh, my gosh. I think because of the ammonia in it, it has been used as a tooth whitener. And uh, yes, they said in the article that people brush their teeth with it. Yeah, that's the whatever the ammonia does. And, but where uh, is the ammonia from, though? Like your oh, liber- your question. body produces it or something? Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, yeah. But like, I don't know. I just I don't get where you're you're telling me it cleans your clothes because I've smelled. Like old people that have incontinence, oh, and that gross. is not a pleasant smell. Gross, 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 gross. You know? Yeah. And Just so, the smell of ammonia is awful. It's so bad. It's the same thing that's in vinegar, right? I yeah. Yes. Vinegar is ammonia. Oh my God. I, oh, when I first got Sigmund, <laughs> Sigmund peed in the house and, like, you know, was like a puppy, and so he peed places. So I was like, going to do a full clean of the house. So I took out every single furniture piece of furniture, like cleared the floor. And I went out and I was like, I remember there's something about ammonia and dog pee and getting rid of it. <laughs> and so I just got vent like, ammonia, Oh yeah. I remember cleaned my whole entire house with it. Right. Then was like, I can't believe you didn't sec. look into that. A it bit. smells kind of more like dog pee looked into it. And it said, Cleaning with ammonia will make your dog pee more in those places. So rather than cleaning all the pee and like neutralizing it, I basically clean clean pee with the clean the the number one ingredient in pee, and only encouraged him to. I, I mean that was a forty eight hour cleaning project. After I did it, I don't get how you came to the conclusion that you were gonna like do it. Without you were like yeah something about ammonia yeah I was like trying to be all organic y and like you know yeah oh, but you Google clean. I know Ugh. I don't Sickens know why me. I did I don't know why I didn't I don't know why I was just oh I was just like you're in a dark place I was I had a new puppy that was pee all over my house that's true it is like I was a, desperate I, I get that because when you have a new baby it's the same thing like, like I'm not thinking straight I yeah. haven't had a, a single night of sleep in the past. Two months. Yeah. Next thing you know, she'll be cutting bangs. Oh my god! <laughs> it's so funny. I was at. I was somewhere. I was at. Like I want to say like Marshalls or TJ Maxx or something like that. And the two girls behind the counter. And I say girls because they were younger, or else I would have said women. Uh, they were. I haven't like pointing people out on that all the time, and now it's bugging me when people refer to older yeah. women as girls. It's I'm like, no, when you habit. stop that, it's a habit. So I'm trying to get out of that habit. So these two young women were talking and they were doing that thing where you like fold your hair over and like try to see if you can do bangs. And like they were talking and I, I couldn't help myself. This is another one of those impulsive Sarah comes out and I was like, mm, make sure you if you make the decision to cut bangs, you haven't gone through anything recently, especially not a breakup. And then I just walked away. Oh my God, you didn't even wait for their reply. No, they just looked at me like, oh, you're right. Kind of like a, that, like maybe I was That's right. That's like your sisterhood thing because you're right. 
Yeah. I was like, somebody had to tell them. Yeah. I was like, definitely like, be careful. Like, you know, thinking about banks, make sure you really want to do it and don't do it on any, like if any impulse or any like, Never. You, like recently cutting your hair at all. It should not be done in a time of turmoil uh-huh. or right. transition. Totally. Um, did you read about the academic hoax where oh these three people, I think they might be academics as well. were submitting papers to academic journals. They submit 20 articles Seven were published, seven were are in review and resubmit, and six were rejected. But they were, like, absurd. And seven were published? Yeah, peer-reviewed this journals. Is a real problem. Uh, legitimate journals, like... That's a big problem. It's a huge problem. And the way that oh, they no. did it is by, like, using all of the terminology... I was just going to say the words. It's almost like... Ugh. Academics have this way of talking and writing that... It's almost circular where you read a sentence and it sounds really great, but you're like, what does that even mean? But they all do it. Yep. And so if you use a lot of the same phrases and and ideas and concepts of like equality, mm-hmm. progressive concepts, mm-hmm. then it seems legitimate. One of the articles was about um, if it was about masturbation. And it argued that if you fantasized about a woman when you masturbated without getting consent, that it was a form of violence. Mm. And uh, that was published. Oh, no. And that hurts. But those values, Ugh. right, of like extreme yeah. progressive and liberal. And you could probably argue that like. Uh, it's terrible I like and i am all. glad they did it i am glad they did it because even though like like the right wing people are jumping on this yeah. they should yeah we that's do need terrible stricter. yeah it should be there should be more oh my god that like makes me nervous right for like a lot of things because also you know i was uh, you know, any paper we write or anything we're researching, we of course go to those journals and we, everything's peer reviewed. But in my research methods class, you know, we had to you know, look into like validity and their design and all this stuff. And in doing that, I, so I went back, you take this class, maybe I think your third or fourth semester. And I went back and looked at some of my papers that I wrote in the beginning and I was like, oh my God, I should have never used those as sort as cited well, those as sources. Like yeah. once I knew yeah. how to be critical of a study mm-hmm. and I was like, oh my God, I don't think, and I didn't learn that until after the research met already in grad school. I had written a lot of papers and I have seen other people's work where they're, nobody's reading, they're reading the abstract. It's like essentially like reading the headline in a newspaper article like in a buzzfeed article and then citing that it's like all the information just getting it from the headline and not really looking at anything yeah here's my headline tivo's amazing well that we know is true it's unequivocally true peer it's been peer reviewed there you go in by the brain candy podcast the Emmy winning pioneers in home entertainment are back they really never left all along they've been innovating and making uh, amazing options for your viewing pleasure, whether you're somebody who's cut the cord and you don't have cable anymore or n- you use an antenna, or if you're like me and you have cable, but like, you know, it's not the perfect choice either. They have a great way for you to view your preferred shows, but you can skip over your entire commercial break with a tap of a button or voice command. You don't have to fast forward or whatever. You can choose to watch certain shows at 30% faster with pitch corrected sound. So like if there's a boring show, but you want to watch it, but you don't want to miss anything. This is such a great, it's genius. I love that. And they have an app. So like when I hear about a show that I want to watch, I just go on the app and it'll record to my device without me even being home or anything. I love that. And they put together a deal just for our listeners, 20% off TiVo Bolt OTA or TiVo Bolt Vox. Just head to TiVo.com slash BrainCandy20. And remember, promo code BrainCandy20, that's TiVo.com slash BrainCandy20 and promo code BrainCandy20 for 20% off. I really love the uh, the ability to use the app because it's very, very easy. And I can watch the shows from the app too, so that's cool. 
Um, so that's that. And yeah, the academic thing is a problem and it's like embarrassing yeah. and it makes me feel like they need to fix the problem. <sighs> but I don't begrudge them for doing it. I'm glad. Yeah, there should it be does a kind of show like it's important to show that this is going on and this is, you know. Yeah. Hmm. Did you read about the lady who pretended to be a cheerleader when she was like, she pretended to be a 15 year old cheerleader when she was like 35 <laughs> and she went to high school and like what? auditioned and everything. Get out. Yeah. She, she did. What? Isn't one of the requirements of being a high school cheerleader that you have to be in high school? Well, she got into high school because she like, I think she used her daughter's name. What is this? <laughs> Never been kissed? Right. Well, the story is quite sad in the end, but like the premise is hilarious. Oh no. But I mean, basically when she was in high school, she had a crappy deal yeah. and, um, but who doesn't, I know that's what I, mean, I feel my, like. Come on. She was a runner, um, but she had speech impediment. So she was mocked mercilessly and then she got pregnant and, Oh. So basically it was oh. like, she's relive. It was like stolen from her really. And she wants to go and relive it. Yeah. I see. And so get- she decided she got this great idea oh to uh. enroll in a high school. So basically, Oh, her daughter's idea. I see. Cause she's got the daughter. And yeah. It's 15 years. Okay, okay. So yeah. people kept telling her like, you look so young. Like, and then she, like a light went off and she's like, Oh, and so she went in to sign up and even in her file, like it says, like she seems, she looks old, but she speaks like a young person. Oh, she had a speech impediment. Well, and she said she tried really hard to mimic her daughter's pe- uh, speech patterns mm-hmm. and like even the way she eats, like the, how teenage girls like take little bites and like act like they don't want to eat. You know how we oh all do God. that? What is that about? And so she became like a teenage method actor oh my God. and decided to try out for cheerleading and, um, the only thing she was actually put in prison for eventually was because she bounced the check on her cheerleading uniform. No. Oh my God. Yeah. She went to jail for this. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I guess. Well, what? thank Christ. Cause imagine if it were a man. Oh my God. It's not okay. Right. It like it's funnier weird. when it's a woman. It but- seems really bizarre. Like it almost seems Ugh. Like it seems really horrible to. In her like trial, it. they everyone had that same sense of like she just needs help. Yeah. Like the, to me, when I was reading it, it reminded me of like a Tanya Harding type personality, oh. where like they haven't, they don't have the tools yeah. to really live right, and so she, this was a good idea in her mind. Oh my god! Obviously, she's estranged from her daughter, who's twenty three now, and is like my mom's. Batch it. Okay, that was my question. Was going to be like, where was the daughter? Yeah. While like she's an adult now. Okay, <laughs> so she's like living her own life, and her mom's like, I think I'll go back to junior high or whatever. That's insane. It literally right. Oh, that's really sad. Mm-hmm. I wonder how many other people out there are just living. On it scares else's me. Life. It scares me too. Hmm. But that you know how like um do you remember that woman who was living in under that tarp and she had been kidnapped when she was a kid and um they found her like 25 years later and she had lived her whole life and with her kidnapper no i think that happens a lot though she was living in the shed in the back and everyone that lived around her was like i can't believe we never noticed anything weird but she had been abducted when she was like 10 and they kept her. Is this like what they based the movie Room out off of or something? I don't or does this know. happen frequent enough to where? I mean, she wrote a book, which I read, and she was impregnated by the kidnapper. Yeah. And those kids then lived in the yeah. shed with her. Oh, my God. But then when she was found, like, she now has to, like, start her life back again. <sighs> I'm um, fascinated with those stories. But, yeah, like, whenever those things happen, it's like you think how many people – are in that position right. now that we don't know about. That's right. what scares me. Like a bunch. Yeah. That's And it's pretty much every year that we uncover some sort of... Remember uh, last year, it was the family in California that had like 
16 kids and they yeah. were kept in cages and stuff like this is to- ugh, this is dark yeah this is totally it's happening. horrifying and i heard that they were at any given time there's 60 active killer serial killers in the united states why so. do you do this well i'm just saying you love saying that i just uh, love stating the facts <laughs> i'm ambassador of the truth yeah. um have you ever heard about fat bear week no it's awesome is it gay <laughs> is it a gay thing it's really funny if you know what it is. Fat Bear Week is like an Alaskan tradition with bears. Like actual bears? Bears. Oh, not the, not the cuddly members. Homosexual. Uh, yeah. No. And it began as like a one-day thing where they would like talk. Because before bears go into hibernation, they, they binge eat. Oh, yeah, fatten up. And yeah, put yeah. on a lot of weight. And so you would pick like which bear you would think was going to win the fattest <gasps> oh, bear. Oh, that's cute. And now it's like a March Madness style tournament of champions with these bears. And they all have names. And there's it's kind of like horse racing, but with fat bears. I, this is adorable. And, and no racing at all. And no racing, the opposite. <laughs> and they watch on live cam. And they watch them feed. And then they vote like, I think this one's going to be the fattest and whatever. And then one of them, they said they watched on live cam, consumed 67,000 calories in three hours of salmon. Whoa, that's a lot. Yeah. I feel like we should participate. I know. That kind of sounds fun. Yeah. That was in New York Times Magazine. And I was like, what is this joyous occasion? That sounds like way more fun than fantasy football. Right, and less CTE, I would guess. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. Like I don't have more to omega bad threes. <laughs> less more, CTE. More omega threes. I was reading. I mean, not to go back to the dark side, but about the the football player who he OD'd, but he had applied for benefits for like disability mm-hmm. benefits in the NFL union after he wasn't playing anymore. He was like maybe 29. He was super young. Oh my God. Yeah. And he died in this thing. Then his brain got, Mm -hmm. they found CTE. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the letter came denying him his benefits like the next day, like coincidentally saying there was not enough evidence that That he was suffering. Yeah. Oh my God. So the league had uh, for the first time ever, reversed its ruling and is now paying his family oh, good. the benefits that he should have been getting. Every single, I mean, just this Sunday we were watching that, you know, football, and NFL has like the fucking balls to do those commercials of like we've changed and we're taking care no. of the play. Uh huh. What? I hate them. And Land and I are both like, that's a joke. Like, why do they pretend? Why do they pretend? And like, what do it, they say they've changed? Just like we're doing the most, we're doing the latest research and finding out where how to make the da 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 da. No, that's a bull- marketing campaign. Sh- totally, it's all that. It's is. so frustrating to see that and be like, oh, you think a commercial is going to help that family that lost? You know, I mean, like what? I have a player just, well, every week this happens, but yeah. you know, somebody had a head injury and went into the back and, you know, went through the full like concussion protocol and everything. And it was a player that Landon had in his fantasy football league and Landon, like his first instinct was, oh man, he's out for the game. And then he's like, oh, good thing he's out. Like ch- halfway through, like caught himself and was like, good thing he's out for the whole game. And like th- my stupid points are nothing compared to like this man who really needs treatment for. And if like you have somebody who's just playing fantasy football, who's like bummed that that player is out. Imagine what the coaches feel like and the team feels like and how they're going to treat him and how, what they're going to do to care for that injury. When the thing is get him back out on the field. Cause he's our number one wide receiver. Right. That's gross. Yeah, it is. <sighs> I think they should get rid of helmets. Right. That's what I, I think. Agree with you want you. people to not use their head as a battering ram? Take out take off the thing that you know. I agree with you. Take it off. I like when you get vitriol like that. Yeah, that's true. I'll tell you what's not gross is what? homesick candles. Mm, delicious. And you know what? They do have a Friday night's lights one. That's true. That absolutely smells like uh exactly that's what you true. think. And it smells exactly like football. And I love that part of it mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. i hope they do improve the game for the players because that part is so amazing yeah. and fun and community, community. and all that mm-hmm. um but 
homesick candles are great because they have all 50 states and they have classic U.S. cities and all different, like, different experiences. And they try to create scents that evoke what you're missing, whether it's, you know, where you live or maybe where you went to college or where you used to vacation, or if you love a road trip, they have a candle for road trips. It makes a great gift. It's a great conversation piece, but it's also really great just to have in your home. They're all natural. They've burned for 60 to 80 hours. And if you go to homesick.com, you can find every single one of the 50 United States candles, plus dozens of classic U.S. cities and popular countries of the world, shipped direct to you and your friends and family in just days. Right now, our listeners get free shipping plus $10 off when you buy two or more candles, just visit homesick.com and use our code brain candy. That's homesick.com and use our code brain candy. All right. Anyway, that was like an emotional roller coaster. It sure Do was. we love football? Do we hate football? I know. Well, like, but that's, that's the, the truth. That's, that's how I feel. Yes. And right. you're right. It's like, that's the part. It's like, I love it, but I also would love it if the family, you know, they were safer and right. Blah, blah, blah. And also I don't think that's like, asking, asking too much. Cheerleaders. Right. I'm ready for that to be a thing of the past. I know a lot of women that really loved being cheerleaders yeah. and that loved that community right. and felt like it was a great way to exercise and like be a part of a team. But I have real I know trouble with that whole thing. Yeah. I was watching a uh you know, watching the game and they show we're showing a clip of a little boy, you know, cheering when, you know, his team got a touchdown. And I just feel like do little girls have the same opportunity to connect with sports in the same way when the only way that they see themselves represented is on the sidelines cheering for the team in tiny cheering outfits. Cheering for the boys. Cheering for the boys. Yeah. In small, can you really, you know, it's, it's it, I don't know. I just think it's harder to try to I know. create that. I think more vibe. now there are cheerleaders who cheer for girls teams too. So that's cool that at yeah, least we like have that. that. There yeah. used to be none of that. Yeah. But I mean, if you wanted to do cheerleading as an independent sport uh-huh. where you just like, yeah, totally. I think something. that's awesome. That's cool. And that's one of my favorite things to watch on ESPN. Oh my gosh. The competitions that they hold at Disney world. Oh, <gasps> they're the they're best. So fun. Oh, and the music is so good. And they're so advanced now. It's not like yes. the olden days. I mean, those people are friggin' athletes. Yes, they are. Oh, also, this reminds me, I wanted to tell you, I've been thinking about it way more. I'm mad at your football, the the people playing the boys' music, too. Thank you. It and only took you a month. Here's why. Oh, no. I was in a car with a bunch of my female friends. We were coming, like, we were driving from somewhere together, and we were singing at the top of our lungs to, like, female anthems. And I was thinking about how much this felt like an in-group, and it clicked in my head that we've only listened to music sung by women. And I was like, oh, wow, that really does do something. And so I could imagine, you know, when right. it's... Th- when th- it's like... The opposite. In a fraternity situation of a yeah. sports team. Yeah, I get it now. Yeah. So Thank you, you Sarah. You're welcome. Finally validating... Yeah. My opinion mm-hmm. and my se- – although they don't play the music anymore because we call it down there and complain oh, so many times. <laughs> so it's quiet down there. They're oh probably my cursing gosh. my name. You think they know who, who it was? I mean there's only a few suspects. That's kind of – that's like when we called in our uh, – the people, our, our neighbors for having the floodlight on 24-7 and then like we made an, a quote-unquote anonymous fo- phone call the week we moved in and then it gets shut <laughs> off. Like who else is it going to be? They have – they don't even have a neighbor on one side. So it's like only us. Why do they have it on all the time? What was their re- what? They're the doomsday preppers. No, it's those same people. And you reported them to who? The uh, association, because they're like rules about that. Uh huh. You know. <laughs> I do know. Yeah, I'm all for that. But anything. like, are Let they nice about, like, to you though? Like, pff, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of contact with them. <laughs> if there, I always say, if there were a doomsday situation. I might be more interested. In my uh, my feeling is a good neighbor is just someone that can identify my dead body. <laughs> I want nothing more than that. <gasps> oh, my God. The other day, the house, like, across the street from mine, surrounded by federal agents. Why? I don't know. Call the association find out. 
<laughs> I don't know if they have that information, but it was kind of like they were, I don't know what they were. They were, I, it's, but they surrounded the whole house and there was like wow. a whole team and they knocked on the door for a long time and nobody came to answer. And then finally the, the woman who lived there answered and clearly told them that whoever they were looking for wasn't home or something because they ended up leaving, but they had the house. So sur- I was watching that's them like scary. surround the house and everything for, and then I like went out and got the mail and that's when I saw him the first, and I was like, Oh my God, there is a federal agent in his full gear and was wearing like the bulletproof vests. Like I was like, what the hell is about to happen? Well, like, is what? this a situation where like, I need to definitely stay inside? How would you describe these neighbors? I don't know. I've never really met them. You couldn't identify their dead bodies. Ooh, I could definitely not identify their dead bodies. Right. Definitely. And they're the ones who really have not had any contact, any interaction, never said hello. They're the one neighbor who I have no idea what's going you on. You have Russian spies living next to you. You know what's really scary that you say that? Because the, the uh, we have another neighbor who was convinced that that was what was going on because the people who moved out of my house, Russian. The people who live next door to us, Russian. Sarah! Yeah. Guess what? Holy crap. Are you Russian? You do I mean, a great a- accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I won't. I won't. That's oh, really... Man. You need to do some I recon. mean, I thought it was just like conspiracy. Like this person was just like a, you Dude, know... You need to look into it. I might have to. Yeah. What are you waiting for? Christ. Yeah, I, I just want to know why the fed- federal agents were... I mean, if they need bulletproof vests, do I? That's you what do. I'm wondering. Do you have a gun? No. Landon does, but I'm... In your house? Ugh. You can say it. I don't know where it is. Oh my God. Well, it's under, I told, like, Landon, like, that thing needs to be, like. Okay, but you should probably know the whereabouts. Yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's in our bedroom. I don't know where it is. Oh my God. It's not like, oh, it's like in a, like a locked, like, like, like with the code. There's no reason we should have it. And in fact, I've told Landon about it and he's like, I'm getting rid of it. But if you do have it, you should know where it is and know the code. I I don't want to because I don't want to. I am the person who will get killed with their own gun because (laughs) I wouldn't even know how to load the bullets in there. My brothers took me shooting and tried to get me to, and I shot a gun and you know what it did? The clip ate me like, and I still have a scar and it all of a sudden it shot out like blood burst it okay. out of my hand right. and i was like oh my god i shot myself my brother's like you didn't shoot yourself but it really i'm like they took me shooting and i shot myself explain what this is and they were like it's just from the clip but it like gushed <laughs> blood and thank god my brother's a, a firefighter and he like you know knew what like was fine with it or like handled it but i'm like i should not no 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 they terrify me yeah I hate all right everything about you've That's I, you've convinced me okay Whew. I was was on the same vein about like prepping and stuff though. I was reading about the, the weirdness of like the homesteading movement, you know, like where the, you like can your own. I'm super into that. Yeah. How it crosses all classes and like, Uh it's that weird thing we talk about with my mom and your mom. It totally is. Cause the hippies are doing it. The, the, the the fundamentalists are doing it. Doomsday preppers are doing it. It's like the extreme conservatives and the extreme liberals yeah. are both doing it and how weird that is that they're, you know, they have the same values essentially of kind of like, well, for some of them it's fear, yeah. you know, where you want to live off oh, the grid. Even like, like fear of the preservatives, fear of the chemicals in the food, fear of the fear government, of the lead in the baby food and so totally. Yep. So there's, there's, you know, common wow. ground there. And then they were talking about this one lady in particular who has an Instagram account where she documents her homesteading lifestyle and sort of the incongruity of Instagramming your uh-huh. your homestead lifestyle, um, but it's real popular. And that they were saying how um, the homesteading throughout the 20th century flourishes in times of strife. So, like during the Depression, then yeah. during World War II, where it, whenever Makes people sense. are like, "Uh oh, yeah," like. Well, maybe there's a big, okay, I can break that down a little bit. Like there's a feeling of anxiety and people want to put those anxious feelings, like put it into action, like do something to, to 
I know what will get will get rid of this feeling if I have an entire back stock of every item that I would need should something happen. I know what would get rid of this feeling, creating a, you know, bunker. Like it's an action to try to address an, an emotional state that we don't have an answer to how to address. Yeah. Well, and this month my book club pick is Educated by Tara Westover. It's a memoir. And she grew up in a Mormon fundamentalist home that believed in this, um, what I don't know, off the grid mm-hmm. thing. Anyway, best book I've read all year. <gasps> Ooh! But it kind of speaks to some of these views in the more extreme. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. mean, some people just like canning stuff and right. but getting chickens. It's like no big deal. Yeah. But some people, it's like a like almost a psychosis. Yeah, I think that's because of the anxiety board. The, totally. The- and you feel like, Compelled. like you said, I'm, I need to be in control yes. of yes. this uh, uh-huh. uncontrollable. Totally. Um, but if you are someone that's at home and you don't want to go out, you should use stamps.com. Easy. It is such a great way to ship stuff because it's convenient, easy, reliable, and efficient because you just print out the postage from your desk or wherever you are, slap it on the package, put it out in the mailbox, your mail carrier will pick it up. And you can buy and print any postage for any letter, package, any class of mail. I use it for everything. You guys get that, you know, any books that I send to you guys in the book club or whatever I send out, you're getting it first from stamps.com because it's so simple. And um, it automatically calculates your exact postage. And it's easy. And right now, you can enjoy the stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a scale, a digital scale, so that you can get that exact uh, wait and know the exact postage. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in brain candy. That's stamps.com and enter brain candy. Now we have a guest. Yes. John Levenstein is one of my favorite people. Oh, yes. He's on Twitter. Friggin hilarious. He's written for like every show, uh, Kroll show, Arrested Development, um, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh my God. He's currently writing for Baskets. And oh, I love that show. You will love John. Oh my gosh. And like, I am obsessed with him because I discovered him on Twitter and his tweets are like right up my alley. Cause they're kind of like a specific kind of humor that tickles me. Mm-hmm. So you should follow him there too. But I just adore him. And we're going to talk about, you know, whether writer, writer's rooms are changing. Are there more women? Oh, yeah. um, I, don't, I don't know. Why is he so cranky? <laughs> Things like that. All the important pressing questions. But the most important thing is you should check out his podcast, which is John Levenstein's Retirement Party, which <laughs> is hilarious because he is not retired and it's not a party. <laughs> so, but it is a great, great podcast. I know you'll love it. Um, it's first season. I've listened to the whole thing and I can't wait for season two. Oh. Anyway, welcome to the show, John. Well, first of all, I'm super nervous because I worship you and I think you're really special and I can't believe I get to even talk to you. So that's the starter. That's, oh, come on. That's Thank the you, wind up. No, I mean it. Like, do you get that constantly where people are just dying to talk to you? <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far, but I, but sometimes. Right. Cause you're a legend. You know, I don't know that I'm a legend, but I do feel like, um, like at a party, yeah. like, you know, if you're at a party, like you're going to, if you're hoping to find one person that you can talk to for a while, who's just not going to be full of shit. Like, I feel like in life I can be sort of that person at the party for people. <laughs> so you walk around knowing that like, you got it. It's okay. Nothing to worry about. Not that exactly. I feel more like I try to state the truth in situations. Yes. Well, and that's what drew me to you on Twitter is that like you are, you're like, um, I don't know what it is about you. Sometimes I don't even know what you're referencing and I'm still intrigued. (laughs) (laughs) Well, again, on on Twitter, like they're speaking the truth, which I I try to do in life, but then you know, Twitter is just more unhinged. It's, 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 I don't really think about that at all. <laughs> I think one time years ago, you did this tweet where you you were annoyed that people always say thank you so much, like they just throw <laughs> it throw it around all the time. And now every time I say it, which is a lot, I have this thing where I hear your voice being uh, upset about it. 
Oh, of course I, of course I say it too. <laughs> and why, like when something like that happens where somebody has a behavior that you find gross or annoying, what, do you just tweet it out or do you think about it for a while? I'll usually tweet it out. <laughs> um, but then the other thing I'll tweet out is just <laughs> like, let's say I have a memory of an annoying behavior, <laughs> like something happened, I forgot it. <laughs> it, and then I'll remember it and then I'll tweet it. And like, sometimes I'll get texts, I'll get texts because I do like have an urgency <laughs> when I tweet as if this irritating thing just happened to me, <laughs> but that's not always true. Just sometimes I remember it's something irritating that happened to you a while ago and suddenly it's fresh. Do you feel irritated a lot? Is this like a defining well, I mean, personality trait? I guess relative to other people, probably. Like other people seem more accepting of their whatever their moment-to-moment -moment circumstances uh, <laughs> than I do. But then I feel like probably, I don't know. I think there's probably things that bug people all the time that they're not expressing. Yes. Right? And like they're making themselves, they're making themselves sick. So am I <laughs> more irritated than those people? I don't know. Because like my experience of it is not that I'm that not irritated by life <laughs> at all. I do think I can be exasperating for those around me. How, you know, what like makes you irritated. think that? Well, uh, from feedback throughout life, it's like, <laughs> I feel like my, like my running commentary on life circumstances, like if you're with me, like <laughs> in a production or in a car or whatever it may be, like over a period of time, I'm kind of discharging those things as I say them. You know what I mean? Whether it's rage at traffic or some sort of yeah. observation or something funny, like moment to moment, it's not necessarily weighing on me, but like for whoever I'm with all the time can be an accumulation where like they're taking some of it on. <laughs> like, like it can feel like constant complaining. So you're purging it, but then they have to absorb it and it's a lot. Yeah, like it's not quite that simple, but yeah. And of course, like if I'm complaining about my environment and someone else is always they're like well they're part of the environment i'm complaining about so like how do you not take that person away? right 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 so i don't i feel in, in some ways I, I feel like i'm probably more irritating than irritated wow that's shocking to me i don't find you irritating at all i'm especially intrigued and by i don't your... consider myself irritated <laughs> maybe that's my projecting <laughs> uh, i um no i can totally i can totally see why i come because also it's like the kind of things that you'll that you'll tweet about so like for instance i <laughs> tweeted something this morning that like after i did it is very uncharacteristic for me and i don't remember what it was exactly but it was something like sheldon whitehouse is doing a great job oh like, what? Okay. like that's not a normal tweet for me no that's not what came over it you was, i i thought he was doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> but to me like Right or wrong, there's a higher bar for me to express. Like, if I think someone's doing a great job, I'm not usually going to say it, even if it's true, because I probably don't have a funny take on it. You know, where <laughs> something more irritating, I'm likely to have a, a more likely, I'd say, to have a funny spin on it. Exactly. I I feel the same way. I don't want to be earnest. There's nothing interesting about that. So, I mean, if you can be, if you can be like earnest and interesting at the same time, great. Yes. But I also feel it can be a fine line. Like, I don't, I'm talking about Twitter just because that's where I spend my social media time. But it's like, it can be a little bit of a fine line on social media between earnest and grandiose, you know? True. I, in fact, worry a lot when I tweet and I'll think, I don't think John's going to like this one bit. <laughs> Specifically about you. <laughs> no, I'm good with you. You're always, you're always <laughs> in the zone. But, um, but yeah, yeah there, but there can be a certain kind of like, earnestness that can transition into advice giving that can transition to like i know better than you you know what i mean from people where it can feel like a lot of over time like it can feel like it's a little bit to put themselves on a pedestal you yeah know? well it probably is like as if you're always being earnest then like why do you think it's why do you think it's always important like what you're earnestly saying that's it's funny that you're bringing that up because i was going to ask you about someone who I think is earnest, but also works in your field. So I can ask you, and if you want me to take it out, I will. Oh, oh no, please do. I wondered what you felt about Nell Scavell. But what do you mean by earnest in her case? Well, I think she's 
been lately, especially, you know, taking on a lot of the political stuff and even with her book, which I loved, um, you know, she was talking about the problem with writers rooms and men and women and all that jazz. And so sometimes she'll call people out on Twitter and is maybe more serious than you would expect from a comedy writer. Right. Okay. I like, I've been friends with Nell for a long time. I usually agree with Nell. And in a Good. way, the difference between Nell and what I'm saying, where if I would, if I said someone was grandiose on Twitter, um, like going back to Nell for a second is like, Nell has the resume for lack of a better word yeah. to back it up. Like she's saying something to people from experience. And my feeling usually is like, well, if Nell is saying something, people should listen, okay. you know, but there can be a lot of on Twitter. Like you don't know what this person's <laughs> life is. Who's giving you advice. That's true. <laughs> like you, like, why are you listening to them? Like, you don't even know if they're happy. You know, it's like, you don't know. <laughs> I feel like Nell is like talking about, career stuff she's right. talking about sexism in the writer's room she's talking about stuff that you absolutely know she's experiencing and has for years you know yes okay that's fine with you then why are you attacking Nell? i love Nell. That's no crazy no she walks on water like <laughs> i just know that sometimes she's earnest so i wondered if she fell into the category that you are referring to that's no. all right. all right good Jesus. The other thing about Nell, along with being like, uh, she was like ahead of her time in terms of um, calling people's attention to the numbers of people on writing staffs. Right. I love like that. Like now, it's like now you can't. Can't really get away with it, even with like a conference. If you had like a conference with ten comedy writers speaking who were all guys and there were no women, like people would be freaking out, right? But there really was a period of time where Nell was pretty relentless about pointing it out, and she was absolutely right. And she was pointing it out at a period of time when other people should have been freaking out more and more. You know, people like John Stewart, who would go up there to accept an award with what seemed like yeah, twenty guys, right? And so do you think she is the reason that there's been change or it just was going to happen naturally anyway? Nell's got to be a part of it because yeah. she was pointing it out so early and she was so relentless about it. But I, people would, they have to have noticed one way or another. You have to think. So what, how much of a I mean, change I do I you I definitely notice? give her some credit, but yeah. it, it seems like something that couldn't stay the way it was. How bad was it and how much has changed? Well, I mean, as far as what I'm talking about, just the optics, first of all, of yes, like the gosh. Daily Show winning and 20 guys going up there and like you're <laughs> counting them, or there's, is it like 20 Jewish guys? <laughs> um, I feel like it's changed in that people, I think, would be more likely to be horrified just looking at that, right? I think that what can still happen sometimes is that some, and I don't know why they want to get away with it, but someone does, like that Sasha Baron Cohen show where it's like, as it's evolving, it seemed like he had maybe 10 writers and they were all guys. Mm -hmm. I feel like, so it can still happen, but I do feel like it's appropriately shamed more now than it used to be, along with the question, like, even if you could get away with that, why would you want that? You know, so I feel like perceptions have definitely changed. Well, that's encouraging. And and, and staffs have changed, and staffs have changed for sure. Wow. But there, But I feel like there's still, like, there's a rot at the top. Really? And you can't know like what part of that rod at the top is like being aged out. And so it's like mm -hmm. whoever the guys are in their fifties and sixties and forties, I guess, who are running shows now because they came up when the system was more skewed in their favor. Will it be self-correcting? And as those guys leave the business, like right now at entry level, things like are people are definitely making an effort for it to be more equal, you know? And so as if also will it take care of itself or is there like a selection problem like what I've noticed on certain shows is they will hire women, but like they'll hire a new woman every year, but it can be um, entry level and then they won't bring her back. And so over time, you've got the old guys who are running shows mm -hmm. and say, well, we're the only ones who've run shows. We're executive producers. But then you've got co-executive producers who are guys, too, because people who are rising to those ranks are guys but then the showrunners are saying, well, we're always giving women a chance. Look, we're bringing in new women every year. But uh, So, like, naturally, based on entry level right now, women and men would be rising together and it would be okay. But hmm. I think it's, I think that the problems coming up now aren't just entry level. It's like, well, what's that selection process where, like, someone comes back and someone doesn't come 
feedback and someone is like the apple of the showrunner's eye and someone else isn't. Well, what's your sense? Is it that these women are duds or that they just um, don't fit in and so they'll just be in place? Well, I think I think it's changing. But I think in the staffs that like historically had problems with women or there'd be like one woman on the staff and that person would be revolving. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be sort of a self a, a self fulfilling prophecy. I think you'd have a showrunner who like has problems with women one way or another. Mm-hmm. Creatively, because he has this like bias going in that a woman isn't going to be helpful or a woman's gonna, not going to be funny or like almost like it doesn't matter who he hires. Like I'm going to hire a woman like that kind of guy who thinks of it that way won't necessarily make the best hire with the person who makes the biggest contribution because they're not even seeing the distinctions in the beginning, you know, also like once that person's on staff, they might have problems listening to women. But I think, I think it starts before that almost with an attitude on those guys part, like almost like that hire doesn't matter. Wow. It's like a token situation. Again, like I think it can still be, or I'm talking about situations where it used to be, but token situation or they wouldn't even, yes. Um, I feel like there's other words for it too, though, and I'm not sure what those other words are. What I was about to say is another example is like they'll hire a woman as a writer's assistant and then like that'll always be the person they promote. But without even like considering so much, okay, is that person funny? Mm -hmm. Is that person the funniest woman? Um, Are we hiring another woman at a higher level who's funny? It can be like the guys who are comfortable with a woman who's in the for want of their word, like secretary job, like the writer's Gross. decision thing. And then like once we're comfortable with her, we're going to promote her. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's a different form of it doesn't matter who we hire because she's not going to make a contribution. It's like what kind of women make men comfortable to hire them. Oh my God. I can't decide whether to be happy or depressed about this story. Well, I, but I do feel like a lot of staffs are getting better. So, I mean, and I do feel like there's more awareness now. Yeah. And I, and I don't, I think, I just think attention has to be paid along the way. You know, there's definitely attention being paid to how staffs are formed now, but like what happens after that? A lot of it, a lot of it can be subtle. So do you think, I'm on a, go ahead. Like right now I'm working over at baskets and I will say like that staff for the last few years where there's more women than men writing there it's very, it's very pleasant. It's like, hmm. and I, you know, I can't say that solely for that reason. I, I, people are like super funny and everything too, but it's definitely also like the nicest staff I've been on. Wow. Of all these years, nicest ever. Yes. Um, like if you had to point out one person there with an edgy personality, it would be me, <laughs> right. but, in, but in, in general, it's just a lovely group that gets along great. What is it about you that makes you edgy? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'll walk right up to the line. So I feel like I can say, like, in my favor that, like, I'm a plain talker. But then it'll go a step <laughs> beyond that where I'm, like, stirring the pot, right? Like, my um, my production company is, is called Salt and Wound. <laughs> like, and I feel like one of, like, an example of a sort of, like, a kind of thing I'll do in group behavior, right, <laughs> is if I feel like uh, someone's being passive aggressive, I can be a little compelled to, like, try to draw it out and get to be, <laughs> get to be a little more aggressive. Because I feel like, well, it's happening anyway. It may as well happen, right? So, like, I can have a nose for that type of thing, like an energy that's in the room anyway. Like, I'll want it to come out. Got but it. that doesn't mean it's always for the best that it comes out. Like, sometimes I won't be respecting boundaries because, like, maybe the person doesn't want it to come out. Whatever it is, <laughs> maybe. It could be nothing. But it's like, um, I'll, I'll push things one way or another. So it's not just that, like, I'm a truth teller, but, like, I'll walk up to the edge. And, like, the same side of me in a group situation that might make people laugh the most, like, saying something <laughs> edgy, maybe even about that person, can also, like, every once in a while cross the line and upset someone. Is What do you think it is within you that desires whatever is under the surface to be exposed in that way? I don't know. And I don't know if that's the only <laughs> thing going on. Um, <laughs> like I'm overly comfortable with conflict in some ways. Um, Me too. I, uh, I would just rather have it if I'm going to have it. I don't know. But then you can also do that. I can end up causing ones. Um, I feel like a part of it also is like I, the family I grew up with where my mother was emotionally unstable after my parents were divorced. Um, there were a lot of like very dramatic situations when I, when I was a kid and like, 
again, even in those situations, I, I somehow like it became a thing where I could be funny in the craziest situations from like a pretty young age. And like almost to a point where like sometimes I wouldn't even know what else to do. And like it's, there was a release <laughs> from it. But so in my own family, like to this day, I can go from getting huge laughs from my family to crossing the line where my mother or sister or whoever is crying. But no. like so fast, like not that often. And if I knew the difference ahead of time, obviously, <laughs> well, of course, I'm not going to do the thing that makes them cry on purpose. I'll only do the thing that makes them laugh. But I don't always know which it's going to be. And I'm not willing to throw the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> He'd rather <laughs> err on the side of the crying. Well, I I know it doesn't sound right. And I will eat myself sometimes, but I don't even know if the things I'm editing are the things that upset people. You know what I mean? I'm just guessing, basically. Wait a minute. How do you know? Because just sometimes something sneaks through quality control and someone gets upset. What do you do? <laughs> I don't understand, though, how you cannot know where the line is. Oh, what's going to upset someone? Yeah. Because so, if I'm basically, like, if I'm telling a joke or having a conversation that's like walking up to a line, let's say of what I think the emotional truth is of in a room right now, like what this dynamic is anyway, like now I'm exaggerating it and making a cartoon of it or something. And like, that's the kind of thing people can find really funny. Right. True. But in making it a cartoon of, okay, like here's what's going on in the room right now. I'm also calling attention to people's different personalities and like they yeah. may have reasons for being that way that I don't know. They may have things that they're defensive about that I don't know about. Uh, you, you just don't know. You never know. Like you don't know when you're pushing someone's buttons and it's fun and it's fun and that's not fun. And some people <laughs> have a better sense of it ahead of time than I do. When, what about it? Your, do you have more than one child? No, one. Okay, what about with your daughter? Is do you ever make her cry? <laughs> very, very rarely. But I'd say okay, so she's twenty now, she's yeah. in college. And and here's an example of like a cry she's doing pretty great right now, I gotta say. She's pre med. Wow. The latest crisis call I got from her was two days ago, and here's what it was. <laughs> she was cringing because the night before She'd been doing some funny character at a party, right, mm -hmm. for some guy that she was talking to and joking around with. And this funny character that she was doing had a lisp, right? And then she realized that the guy that she was doing the character for also Oh, had my a lisp. God. And so she was, like, calling me, what should I do? Should I apologize? I was like, no, do nothing. No, own do it. Do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> But um, so so anyway, that's except for my daughter was concerned that she taken a joke too far, and I've gotten calls from her in college like a couple times. She feels like she's said something like in there was an organic chemistry class last year where she made a joke and she felt like the class responded like she was weird, and she felt really bad about it. Right, yeah. and I was like, well, but then like with the classroom, like why don't you just like not do it like why don't you not do a, a joke to the whole class and she was basically saying because there have also been times she's just gotten huge laughs in that situation See, it's just and like, like there, you yeah and there is something irresistible irresistible about like the formal setting <laughs> saying the thing that's just inappropriate enough to like get the big laugh that releases the tension like that can be a positive right or it can go somehow and cross the line where either you're not getting the laugh or you've upset someone. There's like lots of things that can happen. But yeah, so my daughter kind of walks the line a little bit too. I would say in general, though, my experience with her is that she thinks I'm hilarious and her friends have always thought I was funny. And okay. I, I have good relationships with her friends. Like it's been a long time since I would say I made my daughter cry or I would really upset her. And I, I would say like one of the biggest lessons I had to learn as the father of a teenager, though, and I, like I was a single father for when she was 14 on, was um, like even though I never would have considered hitting her or anything like that, there were some times when she was, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, that I would yell. And like the way that like a teenager, especially a teenage girl, like experiences even like a raise in volume, like there is something violent about that, yes. you know, even if there's no threat, even if there's no threat of violence behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's like almost like because it was always a no brainer that like I was never going to hit. I do feel like there were a couple of years when she was at her most irritating, that I did give myself <laughs> permission to yell. And like, I just had to take that. I had to take that away at some point. Like that was a big thing. So, and I would say that even like 
if it were going to be a sort of situation where she cried when she was like 15 or something like that, I could imagine that maybe she did something wrong. Maybe I said something about it. Maybe she was defensive and said something that made it worse. Maybe I yelled. And like whatever the thing was about, ultimately, probably what was causing the tears was that I raised my voice, you know? Yeah. But you now don't do that. <laughs> no. I'm surprised, by the way, since you mentioned when you are in a room and you get the big laugh, that you have not been a person that does stand up. Is that accurate? Yeah, I've never done stand up. I read, um, sometimes I'll read stories and storytelling, sh- and storytelling shows. I just, I never had a desire to be exposed in that way, like stand ups are. Hmm. Um, I don't love jokes, really. Like if I, so if I did stand up, it would be like maybe it would have been fine. I don't know. It, I never wanted to do it. I also, because like when I graduated college in the eight, 80s. Like, and I used to hang out with stand-ups who were friend of, friends of mine at the improv because I would write sketch comedy for them. Mm-hmm. I hated the environment. So I feel like it partly depends when you come up. Like, yeah. if I come up doing, and I felt like the people who were doing stand-up were people I enjoyed hanging out with, and it was an environment like a bar or something that I liked, that might have changed how I felt to that. But like, like, when I was figuring out what I was going to do with my life in my 20s, like, stand-up clubs felt like a very hostile environment to me. And the kind of conversations that stand-ups would have with each other after their shows, I just, I never liked it. So so I didn't aspire to be part of, a part of that world. And I, I don't know how I could, I could have been a stand-up, like, in the 80s, for instance, which if I'd done it, probably would have been where I'd done it, without being then also a part of the stand-up world. And you don't desire it now? It's not something you're like, maybe I'll give that a try? Oh, God, no. I mean, to me, like the idea that now, like late in life, suddenly I'm getting out there like Mrs. Maisel. Look at me. You never thought I was a stand up, but here I am. It's like, that's like, that would be such a funny thing to do. Yeah, we can, we can. That's why I'm surprised, though, then that you chose to do the podcast because you're Mr. Fancy and you are so successful and you could rest on your laurels. And it seems like such a big production to do. So, why did you no, do it? No, my podcast. My yeah. podcast, you mean? Yeah. I, well, because Mary Kobayashi, my co-host and my friend, had like convinced me that just technology-wise, we could get done. We could do a bunch of interviews. She'd edit them together. And I thought about different ways anyway of like looking back at my career and wanting to tell stories. And I feel like an overriding theme for me is I didn't really want to do it by myself. So like mm-hmm. doing this show doing the podcast it was a way for me to tell stories for my career but like not have to do all the heavy lifting myself and it like it evolves over time because there's no one episode where it's like now you understand what my life was but like as i put the pieces together of the show and like covering different decades it did become really interesting to me just the picture that emerged and getting to see things about myself through other people's eyes so it was like a very um very narcissistic in a way and that like I was dragging other people into this thing about <laughs> me, but it was also a fun, it was a fun way to reconnect with people, um, to hear stories I'd never heard, to hear stories I'd forgotten, to fill in pieces I'd never known about. Um, and, and, and in every case, like reconnecting with people, it really did feel like going back right away. I'm, I'm a nostalgic person by nature yeah. anyway, I would say. And, even more so lately. And so there was a part of the show where it was like the joke of I'm saying it's a retirement party, but I'm not really (laughs) retiring. But even once you, even once you say it, there's like something that happens to your brain, right? Where you start getting a little more nostalgic. You start treating conversations that you're having for the show as if they're special. It's like this weird voice in your head, like, Oh, I just want to quickly take a break in this interview with John, who I love to talk about something else I love, which is BioClarity. If you guys listen to Brain Candy, then you already probably know, but it's worth repeating. BioClarity is this awesome three-step skincare routine that is affordable and effective, and it doesn't irritate your skin. I use the clear skin routine because I have troublesome skin, and it works amazing, amazing results. It's got all kinds of green stuff in it, you know, like it makes you feel like you're doing good stuff to the earth, but you're also doing good stuff to your skin. And now you can get one of their clarifying masks that is a poor purifier and it's delivered straight to you. 
And you can get started on healthier habits with your skincare if you go to bioclarity.com. Our listeners will get their first month for 50% off a routine, plus shipping is free, and it comes with a 100% risk-free money-back guarantee. But you have to enter our code, BRAINCANDY. That's bioclarity.com, and enter our code, BRAINCANDY. You won't regret it. Tell me what you think. All right, back to the interview. Here's what I want to know. So my co-host is in... um, a master's program for psychotherapy, which you studied as well. And I read that you never considered yourself sort of like one of those people that's like a student of comedy that learns all about previous humorists, etc. And I thought it seems that you're more of a student of human behavior and that's what has made you so good at your job. Do you think that's true? I feel like that's, I feel like that's mainly, I feel like that's mainly true. I, um, I think it makes me good in two ways. Here's here's why I split for a second. I think it makes me good at my job. It's what I find funny is human behavior usually in one way or another or whatever the dynamic is, just like trying to get at what the emotional heart of something is usually what's going to make me laugh. But also, this wasn't from the beginning of my career, but like later when I got into sitcoms and like into writer's rooms, which always had 10 or 12 people, there's like that human behavior within the writer's room too. So it's like two things. It's being able to cope in groups and then also being able to like make human behavior funny and write about human behavior. And there's some writers who are like one of the two. So like there's some writers who can write about human behavior, but they're hopeless in a group of people. Mm. And then there's some who are like slick and a group of people, but they're not funny. They can't write about human behavior. Right. Um, so I think it's, so I think it kind of like, it, it helped me in two ways. Like I had already mm-hmm. gone to grad school to be a therapist. I was always interested in that. Like it helped me in my writing, but it also helped me in my environment, I'd say. I've read also that you may or may not be a fan of the real world. Is that true or false? Oh, okay. Wait, so, <laughs> I'm like, go back for one sec. What's the other thing you're... Oh, not being a student of comedy. Yeah. I used to love watching comedy. Oh. I, I have a harder time watching comedy since I started started writing comedy. But yeah, I was never a student of it. And I don't I don't understand people who can watch the same comedy over and over again. Like, yeah, I've never been like that. I don't mm. remember things well. Even And on shows I'm on, like, the more complicated they get, <laughs> there'll always be someone on the show who's, like, a student of the history of the show I'm writing for. Yeah. <laughs> and I never even know that show that well, I'd say. <laughs> because the other thing about, like, trying to base my writing on life and human behavior as opposed to basing it on other shows is I feel like I'm less likely to plagiarize. So I... Yeah. I feel like before I sort of found my voice, I'm thinking of like maybe writing movies in the 80s or even like when I was first writing on sitcoms, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I was probably more likely to write something that was some variation of something I'd seen. Whether I knew I'd seen it or hadn't known I'd seen it, um, it somehow like gone in the hopper and like Mm -hmm. whatever came out maybe wasn't truly plagiarism, but then later I'd see, oh yeah, maybe I wrote that because I was reminded of this other thing. And I feel like because in the past I saw so much comedy, I started to like whenever possible, like write from life and write from experience as opposed to writing for other shows. So I feel like if I'm using as an inspiration some other show, there's more of a chance that that's going to lead me to something else without realizing it is also lightly plagiarized, right? right? Whereas if I'm taking something from my own life, even if it ends up going somewhere that might be a little bit like something that someone else did and I hadn't realized it, it's coming more from a place of integrity, you know? Right. I never thought about that, but I could see that. And I just feel like so many people, you watch so much, like if you, unless you have a perfect memory, the chances of unintentionally plagiarizing are so high. Mm -hmm. And if you do have a perfect memory, that's like being in prison. Like every idea (laughs) you have has to be weighed against this perfect memory of every comedy you've ever seen. It's like, is it like that? Is it like that? Even that checklist sounds exhausting, you know? Right. So the more you can get to the core of like what you believe, what you've experienced, but like what your unique take on it is, less of a chance like someone later is going to say that's exactly like that thing of mine that I wrote that I know you saw. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But I'm surprised Um, more people don't fall into that category of what you're describing where it's more about human behavior. or Or what people do is they'll go a little too far where like they're almost trying to steal other people's experience where as soon as they have a friend who says something real halfway interesting to them 
the friend who's either a sitcom writer or a mm-hmm. stand-up comic writer. Oh, can I use that? Right. Like, use that? What? A thing I just told you that happened when I was walking to the 7-Eleven? <laughs> right. My like people life. can be a little too quick to use things from, from real life where they've almost like they're never even filling the tank, you know, because they're trying to pull things out like as soon as they happen. Like, right. is that something? Is that something? I'm like, that's the way to live. You've got to live your life and like then think about but not live every moment thinking, is this a bit for a TV show? Right. All right. I like that advice. There was a lot of that in the 90s, I feel like, when there were so many shows and all these sitcom writers all over town looking at, like, every possible interaction with, like, any service personnel <laughs> is, like, is this a possible Seinfeld or Friends type bit? And you would watch these interactions? And, and yeah, I'd watch them happen in real time. I'd hear people talk about oh, them. Geez. It's like there's a real desperation behind it. Right. Um the real world, I watched early on. I yeah. don't remember the last year I watched it. And I did see a little bit of you on Road Rules, but that came after Real World, right? Yeah. A little bit. And if I watched that, that would have been around when I was done with Real World, I would say. So, like, oh. how many years into Real World did Road Rules happen? Um, Three. So I couldn't have watched, and I couldn't watch everything religiously, but I couldn't have watched more than like five years of her world, I would <laughs> After say. After that, it just starts to be redundant. So which were the first ones? It was New York, right? Yeah, New York and, and then, then LA what? and then San Francisco with, with Puck. Yeah. And then um, Boston. I watched, I watched Seattle for sure. Oh, that was season six, and I was on Road Rules when that aired. And was that your first year? That was like your second year on Road Rules. That was my first year. Oh, so your first year on Road Rules wasn't the first year of Road Rules. Right. It was season six. Okay. So that was around that. I know I watched Seattle. So that must have been. What year was that? 98. Why was that the year I was watching? That's so <laughs> what weird. Were you what, doing? Was, what was my life? I was writing sitcoms. That's, I was happy. That's really cool. <laughs> exactly. But anyway, no, I watched Real World Seattle because I remember the plot around Lyme disease. Yes, right. And the slap heard around the world. Yes. <laughs> and then I watched some road rules. And then I don't think I watched much of either show ever again. It's like you, you went back to road rules after that, right? Well, I went on those challenges, yeah. So after, right, and this is where Dan, the Kroll Show uh, editor and director, knows everything I don't know. So after Road Rules, there's this thing, the challenge, and you would do that off and on for a while? (laughs) Yeah, like periodically. I did seven seasons total. So spanning how many years from, like, beginning to end? Mm, Twelve years. So did your, like, persona, even, like, on camera to the degree they let it happen, did it change over that span of time? It did a little bit, but because they had set me up as like this, the virginal, whatever, then I kind of got a good edit forever. <laughs> uh-huh. And then they wouldn't show like me being mean or anything. I love how you flip this around. This is impressive. But I was just going to say, but you would think that they would have thought it would be a better story that you were changing growing. You know what I mean? True. Like, but- why not work? Why not work with what's really there? Well, on the challenge, it was more about the game than it was about people's personal journeys. Right, right. So it was inconvenient to have to talk about somebody's inner personal. I life. get it. Like once, like once they don't really sit you up. Um, yeah, well, liked about real world. I th- I'd say I tend to favor um, reality shows without plot. Like I, I liked how aimless real world. Was. Right, because you like human behavior. I do think there's a link there. Yeah, things things emerge. Things emerge when you're watching a show like that. Yeah. As opposed to like sometimes like if the game of whatever the show is is too strong, like some of the narratives of reality shows can be stronger than I want. I, I like things that bump along a little bit. <laughs> right. But that's not that's rare now. They usually are just they're more produced now. Right, because they can't take any they can't take any chances. So <laughs> so for instance, I would consider like, you know, I like um whatever their package, but like, I'll watch some real housewives. I'll watch oh, yeah. Southern charm. And those are not competition shows. Those are just like lightly packaged sort of real things. You what know? do you like about those? Again, it's like, <laughs> I like the behavior. 
I like the contrast between how people behave publicly versus what's really going on with them. Like all those shows I turn on after a while and I stop being loyal to them. Like Southern Charm, I thought was kind of interesting at points because I like the civility versus mm. the behavior. But again, now that people are like being arrested for rape, it's like it's not cute anymore yeah. over there. <laughs> right. um, and then Real Housewives, I felt like. Mm-hmm. There'd been a couple markers along the way where I feel like it's not cute anymore at Real Housewives too, like including the suicide of the husband of one of them. Um, right. Like it's, it's it's a pretty dark show in some ways, Real Housewives, and like also behavior of someone staying the same over time. Like even that is depressing on Real Housewives. Like if they're not getting better, they're getting worse. And like to act the same way at forty five as you did at thirty five, it doesn't mean the same thing, you know. I can't believe you indulge in any of these, to be honest. So I'm going to ask you our last question. Okay. How'd, how'd we do, Susie? Well, you're my favorite ever, so. Oh, Susie. 100 Let's, out of um, 100. We really will. We will karaoke sometime, right? Do you promise? Yeah. No, I do it. I do it pretty often. I'll just put you on the list. What's your signature song? It's changed over time. I would say until recently, my signature song was probably Sunday Morning Coming Down. I don't even, what is that song? It's a stirring Johnny Cash song oh, written by Chris Christopherson. That sounds um, amazing. I do She Thinks I Still Care from George Jones. Wow. But then I've got a couple slightly more current ones teed up. <laughs> but I can't say they're my song yet because I haven't tried Right, yet. yeah, you got it. Okay. But I'm, I'm very, let me just say this. Yeah. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> Me too. I can't wait to go. This is exciting. Uh, my last question is, what do you keep in the trunk of your car, John? I drive mm-hmm. a Scion IQ, which is the smallest car you can get with a back seat. It looks like a smart car. When I say the smallest car with a back seat, I mean the passenger side seat is pitched forward and there's like a sham passenger seat behind it there's not room behind the driver's seat for a seat because it's the size of a smart car there is no trunk wow it was this intentional you don't like trunks i don't like um i don't have great spatial relations and i'm always like if i drive a normal size car i hit things a lot not like big accidents or anything but like hitting a pole um hitting a curb i just do not have a good sense of space and what i love about the small car is i've never had a better sense like the car is an extension of me um like i know what size space i can fit into and also when i was first thinking of getting it my daughter was a teenager at the time and she was so mortified at the thought that that encouraged me too because i thought like well what does she care what kind of car i have (laughs) she was invested yeah and that itself i felt like i can i'm going to breaker of that habit of caring what kind of car there is. <laughs> That'll show her. And I did it. Wow, I'm real proud of you. That's great. And you're the only person that's answered that way, so I like <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you. It was thank good you. to meet you, Susie. Thank you, friend. Let's talk soon. Okay. Bye, John. Bye.